Good morning, everyone. Would you please stand and let's praise together. Oh! Let's get it. Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done. Earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done. The earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. Thank you. 
the earth may pass away, the word remains the same. Yes, history can prove there's nothing you can do, faithful and true. Though the storms may come and the wind may blow out. to see you all this morning. Would you please turn to someone and say, it's good to be loved. Good morning, everybody. It's great to see you here. Welcome to Hope. My name is Jordan Branch. Uh, I'm part of the staff here at Hope. And my name is Erin Harthen. I'm the Kids Ministry Director here at Hope. And welcome to all of you here in person. It's great to see your faces. Yeah, and welcome, too, to everyone who's not here in person. But if you're joining us online through one of these cameras, we're glad that you can be with us and worship as well. If you are here in person, if, if you're in fifth to eighth grade, we have our junior high uh, leader, Brandy, right there at the back. She's waving. This is your opportunity to go with her. She's got your junior high program already. And an extra special welcome to you if it's your first time here in person. We have a gift for you, so make sure to pick that up at the information table on the patio after service. It's just our way of saying thanks for joining us. On your way in today, you probably got a program. If you got a program, can you hold it up for me just so I can see it? 
Uh, lots of programs. Waving in the breeze, how beautiful. If you could pop those open, you've got a connection card in there. and We really value that connection card. We'll tell you why in just a moment. But if you could take just a second to fill that out, that would be incredible. Yes, one reason is to let us know that you're here, sign up for some cool opportunities. You can also uh, let us know if you want some more information or how we can pray for you. And then when we get that connection card back at the end of the service, for every one that we get back, we donate a dollar. So this impacts the community directly just by filling out that card. Uh, three organizations that we'll donate to. One is Team World Vision. They help provide access to clean water. A local one here is Network Medical. And they provide free medical services and support to women who are experiencing unexpected pregnancies. And then another local one is Olive Crest Hope Refuge. And they help rehabilitate girls who have survived sex trafficking and are getting out of that life. Yes, yeah, so when you exit, you'll notice a table with three bins with the names of those organizations. Just put your connection card into the bin that you want your dollar to go to today. Yes, that's right. Uh, this Tuesday, we are taking a group of folks from Hope. We're going up to Isla Vista, and we are going to be preparing a fresh, hot meal there for our friends without homes. If you'd like to join us, we'd love to have you. Just let us know uh, on your connection card, and we'll get you some more information. You can prepare a meal, serve a meal, or both. Yes, and then speaking of meals, next Sunday, you may not know this, but now you do, it's Father's Day, and we are going to be celebrating dads big time. We are going all out. Yeah, we're going to have dad's root beer, we're going to have pancakes, it's going to be delicious. Pancakes and root beer, that classic age-old combination, <laughs> right? Perfect for celebrating Father's Day, but seriously, it's going to be a ton of fun. So if you're a dad, bring your family, and if you know a dad, bring one. Yes, and I believe we're going to have a couple of raffle prizes as well, so you may even leave with something sweet in your hand, so look forward to that. Uh, that is it for us. Now, please welcome Gabe Hollis to, to start a brand new series, The Devil's Playbook. Good morning, everybody. How's it going? <coughs> How many of you, just by a show of hands, have ever owned, even for a short period of time, somewhere in your life, a day planner? Anyone ever owned a day planner? Okay, I got some people here. How many of you who have owned one have consistently used a day planner in your life? Okay, uh, looks like significantly less. Um, I, I'm not a real good planner myself, N not only because I, I don't do it very often, but also the things that I plan aren't real great, and then the plans don't really go according to plan. Like, I remember one plan I had, I planned with some friends, I don't know why we planned this, but we planned to go see the Hannah Montana movie, and uh, yeah, I went there, and uh, I showed up half an hour early, because I like to get there early, because I got long legs, and I like to find the spot where you get the most leg room. So I was like there like half an hour early, which is weird for everyone else showing up and just seeing it like a... 30-year-old man sitting uh, in a theater by himself waiting for Hannah Montana, the movie, to start. And uh, time got closer for the movie to start. They're not showing up, and they're still not showing up. And then I get a text saying that they can't make it. And so I'm stuck watching a movie, the Hannah Montana movie, by myself in a room full of uh, female tweens, and it was the most awkward hour and a half of my life. So not good at making plans, not good at my plans going according to plan, but one thing that many Christians uh, take a lot of comfort in is this idea that God, God has a plan for your life. He's a lot better at planning than I am. Now, there's a lot of debate back and forth about how specific that plan is, whether it's kind of a broad thing or a really specific, all the details are planned out, and, and there's debate about, you know, how do I find out exactly what that plan is? My, that's not even what I'm here to talk about. I just want to make the point that God's, God's got some things He wants to have happen in your life. And in fact, He's got things planned. He planned for you to do. The Apostle Paul says in Ephesians 2, chapter 10, he says, uh, he says this, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, uh, which God prepared... For us in advance prepared in advance for us to do he planned good works for you to do in advance There's things that he wants you to do that he's planned for you to do that hopes you will do and there's things That he does not want you to do and even when it's hard to follow the plan that He's laid out for us which we can we can find a broad plan for our lives Just by reading the Bible and seeing how he wants us to live our lives Even when it's hard to do we can trust that his plan is good because he died for us And when someone's willing to die for you to save you you can put your trust in them 
So, uh, many people take comfort in that idea, God has a plan for your life, but here's something that Christians don't take comfort in, partly because it's not comforting, and partly because we don't really consider this, or think about this, or talk about this very often. Um, and this is this idea, consider this, this might be true. The devil has a plan for your life, and if that's true, his plan for your life would be the opposite of the plan that God has for your life. His plan would be for you to do bad things things to do bad works to get to, do, to go to any length to get you to do things that would destroy yourself and destroy others and most importantly destroy and separate you from god the source of life and the source of all things that are good the bible says that god that all good and perfect gifts come down from god the father of heavenly lights he wants to cut you off from that he wants to separate you from that and make you miserable the devil Perhaps has a plan for your life and if he does have one it is not a good one now um, Maybe uh, You're here and you, you hear about Satan and you know Christianity is kind of a new thing You're not real a religious person, but you hear about Satan and you know when you hear that word the devil You, you kind of think like you know that's in the same same category as the tooth fairy or Santa Claus or the Easter Bunny or or whatever um, The the bar a Barna group the Barna group which uh conducts polls and surveys, uh, did research on people who called themselves Christian and asked them um, to respond to this statement. Satan uh, is not a living being, but a symbol of evil. Satan's not, he's not an actual being out there. He's just a symbol for evil. And uh, 40% agreed strongly with that statement. 19% uh, agreed somewhat. 9% uh, disagreed somewhat. 26% disagreed with that, strongly disagreed that Satan's a living being, and 8% uh, weren't sure. Now, I don't think that this is actually a good way of understanding what Christians measured uh, what people who call themselves Christians believe. And just because you call yourself a Christian doesn't make you, uh, in fact, a Christian. Many people think because, you know, uh, my parents were Christians that I'm a Christian. Or many people think if I go to church, that makes me a Christian. Or I went to church growing up, so I'm a Christian. Th that doesn't make you uh, a Christian. You might have heard the saying before, uh, going, being in church doesn't make you a Christian any more than being in a garage makes you a car. It takes more than that. There's more to it than that. It requires putting your uh, faith in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sin, repenting, turning from your sin, turning to him, asking for forgiveness, um, uh, believing that he rose from the dead and choosing to follow him and his teachings committing yourself to do that doing that knowing that along the way you'll fail and have to ask for forgiveness again that's what goes into being uh, a christian but what we can learn from these this research is that there are many people who have been fairly exposed to christianity and still think of the devil as nothing more than a symbol of evil and not a real living being so is there any reason we have to actually believe that Satan uh, exists? Is there any reason to believe that the devil exists? Well, if you are, in fact, a Christian, and you do trust in Jesus, you, sure, you certainly should believe in Satan. You certainly should believe the devil exists, because Jesus believed in Satan. Jesus spent a lot of his ministry casting demons out of people. There was a time when he cast uh, a legion of demons out of just one single individual. He not only spoke about the devil, he spoke with the devil. Uh, and we're going to talk about when he does that in a future message in this series. Jesus himself believed in Satan. So unless you think that Jesus was a liar, or if you think that he was delusional, or you think that just the whole concept of Jesus was made up, even though that's contrary to what the vast majority of New Testament critics and historians have to say about Jesus, uh, Unless you believe one of those things, you should believe that the devil exists. Because Jesus believed that the devil exists. Now, maybe you do believe that Jesus was a liar. Maybe you or believe that he was delusional. Or maybe you believe the whole thing was a myth contrary to what the vast majority of scholars would say on the issue. Um, is there anything outside of Jesus believing uh, in this evil spiritual being that could give us reason to believe? Well, there's certainly a whole lot of eyewitness testimony of supernatural events of demonic occurrences although most of the time when these things happen um, many people who experience them are afraid to talk about it because they're afraid of how other people would think about them i mean imagine if you were experiencing something like that you might not be real quick to want to tell people what you had seen or experienced because other people might think of you as 
lying, saying it to get attention, saying it to make money, uh, to write, you know, get a book deal, saying it because maybe there's something that will think there's something wrong with your mind. So people who experience these sorts of things aren't often um, ready to talk about it. And oftentimes when they do talk about it, it's just their own personal experience. And, and how do you get outside of their personal experience and, and know that there's some sort of verification to it? Well, I want to share with you one story where there uh, was a lot of um, eyewitnesses to some supernatural ongoings. Uh, that are certainly consistent with the existence of the devil and what the Bible has to t teach about the spiritual realm. And this was, con uh, this was written about in a significant news source called the Indianapolis Star in Indiana by Marissa Kwiatkowski, who uh, went through 800 pages of official documents documenting the things that happened in this case. And she conducted over t a dozen interviews with a Catholic priest, with the family that was going through these things we're going to talk about, with... Uh, government officials with police officers and uh, she does a really good job of, of um, taking a lot of different information and, and pulling it together different eyewitness accounts different official documents you can read the article yourself uh, just go to the Indianapolis Star website and search for Ammons A-M-M-O-N-S A-M-M-O-N-S and so uh, what she documents in here is that uh, in 2011 Latoya Ammons brought her family which was her mom and her three kids who were aged uh, 12 and under, uh, to a new home in Gary, Indiana. And uh, this was November 2011. It, just a month later, in December 2011, when it's really cold and, and most of you know, the bugs have died, the first weird thing uh, happened, which was the screen on the porch around their house was suddenly swarming with big black flies. And no matter how many times they'd kill all the flies, they would just come back. So, I mean... That's kind of weird, but, you know, nature does weird things, so, um, I don't know, you can look past that, or, or, you know, maybe that's something strange to you that's convincing, but um, they would also experience weird things inside of the house. They would uh, often hear footsteps going up and down the stairs in the basement when nothing was there. They would hear the uh, basement door open and close. Uh, they, they would go and lock the basement door, and they would still hear the door open and close. Uh, one time, uh, Latoya's mom woke up in the middle of the night and saw a shadowy figure walking around in the house, and she went to check it out, which I don't know why anyone would do that. I would just sell the house and then burn it afterwards, but she got up and looked at it, and uh, there was wet footprints where the shadowy figure had been. So, so far, it's all just, you know, kind of confined to this family, this story that we're hearing about, and their own personal uh, experiences. Uh, and, you know, they were kind of had a religious background, so maybe that sounds a little bit biased, and maybe they're just saying, maybe they're just making this up, maybe they're just trying to get a book deal, who knows? Um, but more and more people start to get involved with this. They have friends over one night, late one night, and uh, Latoya goes to check on her kids to see if they're sleeping, and she finds that the three kids are sleeping, but her oldest, the 12-year-old, was not only sleeping, but levitating several feet above the bed. So she calls all her friends in. They're all freaked out. They don't know what to do, so they start praying, and eventually this body levitates back down onto the bed, and the friends never visit that house again. So you start to see that there are other people who are seeing what's going on in this house and don't want to be a part of it. So she doesn't know what to do. Latoya doesn't know what to do. What the heck are you, who do you call? Ghostbusters? I don't know. What do, you, what do you do in this sort of situation? So she talks to some clairvoyants, which we're going to learn in a, a couple weeks is a really bad idea. They tell her to do some rituals, and uh, things go smoothly for a few days after that, after she does these rituals, and then all of a sudden things get way worse. Her kids have these episodes where their eyes bulge, and they have these weird grins on their faces, and they're speaking in low voices, and one of them gets thrown out of the bathroom by an invisible force that knocks this kid into the other kid, and they have to go get stitches. And so she's at a complete loss. What, are, what am I supposed to do about all this stuff that's going on? So she decides, I don't know what to do, so I guess I'll just take them to the physician, and maybe they can do something there. Maybe they can figure out uh, some sort of uh, solution to this. So this is where kind of the government gets involved and documentation gets involved. And while she's there, something crazy happens so that somebody calls the Department of Child Services, and they send family case manager... Uh, Valerie Washington to check it, check it out, and she sees something crazy there as well, and at a certain point, the government takes custody of her three children for six months. This is farther down the line, but in the intake report, in this official government intake report, um, it has some really weird stuff that you would not expect in a government document about what happened 
at that time at the doctor's office. And I have some screenshots of it here. You can find it online and read the whole thing for yourself. It's kind of interesting. But I'll read you what it says because it's a little bit small on the screen. But this says, the medical staff, this is the medical staff reported that while the children were at their primary doctor's office, the medical staff reported that they observed, they redacted all the kids' names, uh, this kid be lifted and thrown into the wall with nobody touching him. Um, so that was really weird that there was the medical staff saying this happened, not the family. Um, another another uh, time, the nine-year-old stated that, oh, so this is when uh, the family case manager shows up. That's the kind of that thing that happened that got the someone to call the Department of Child Services, so they send a case manager over, and then she, this, this happens while she's there. Nine-year-old stated the ghosts are attacking him and his brother. Child became aggressive and walked up the wall as if he was walking on the floor and did a flip over the grandmother. The episode was witnessed by the psych counselor and DCS worker FCM Washington. Um, so they go, the, the, the case manager from the government and the psych counselor go and talk to another doctor and say, we just saw something in, insane and we don't know what to make of it. And so the doctor uh, come, is like, what are you talking about? Of course that didn't happen. So the doctor tries to talk to the kid and say, do, do that thing with the wall again. And the kid doesn't know what he's talking about because the kid doesn't remember walking up the wall and doing a flip. Um, so uh, the case manager was quoted in an interview later saying, it's taken me a wh for a while to move past that. I believe that it was something going on that there was uh, something was going on there that was out of the realm of a normal living person. So there's a lot more to the story. You can read it for yourself if you want. The police get involved. They're very skeptical at first, but as they examine the house, they become freaked out. The police chief, Brian Miller, uh, is very reluctant to believe, but he sees a lot of weird stuff in there, including the, he says the blinds were bleeding oil, and so he wiped them all down, went out of the room, watched the door for 25 minutes, went back inside, and he said they were still bleeding oil. Eventually, LaToya gets a Catholic priest to come do some exorcisms on her, and eventually, the nightmare stops. Now, you can believe that, or you can not believe that, but this, was in, this is weird stuff to find in official government documents with a whole bunch of different eyewitnesses from different backgrounds of life, uh, and the, the police officer himself said that uh, it took him two years before he was able to talk to anybody about this because he was really thought people would think that there was something wrong with him if he said something about this. So you have stories like this that people are talking about. Um, you have Jesus who believed that there was uh, demons, and he himself talked to Satan. Uh, many people are convinced by the fact, because they, they see the evil in the world. You look around you, and you see all these horrible, evil things, and you think to yourself, there has to be something that it doesn't seem like human nature and mental illness is enough to explain the degree of darkness that is going on in this world. There's got to be something beyond that. And it's also interesting how oftentimes people believe that um, they believe God does not exist because of the evil in the world, but they don't believe that the devil exists because of the evil in the world. Now, you hear all these things, and, you know, maybe you're still not convinced of this other spiritual world, of, of Satan existing, of there being demons. Um, but actually, if, if Satan exists, you would expect, that was something you would expect, that there would be probably a significant degree of doubt in a lot of people's minds that he exists. There, uh, imagine for a second that it's your job to make your neighbor's life as miserable as possible, just destroy their life. What you won't do is spend like five minutes building a catapult in your front yard facing their house and then fire it at them. Or you wouldn't go into their house with like a band of horn players playing a bunch of fanfare when you light their couch on fire. That's not how you would go about doing it. You would want to remain as undetected as possible. That's why there's a quote attributed to uh, a French philosopher named Charles Baudelaire. Uh, that says, the greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world he doesn't exist. So, there's only so much so far I can go uh, to convince you uh, of these sorts of things. Um, I think if you're a Christian, you certainly should believe, like I said, because Jesus believed. And if you do, if you're willing to trust Jesus, what do you do about an enemy with an army that you can't see? What do you do about an enemy with an army 
that when people experience it, they often, and talk about it, they often get labeled as liars or greedy or maybe they're having some mental illness going on. And if there was an army who was making you suffer in ways you couldn't see, but you knew that you were suffering, who would you blame for the suffering in your life? Maybe the people closest to you? Maybe the people you disagree with politically or morally? That's why the Apostle Paul reminds us of this in Ephesians 6, 11 through 12. He says, put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the enemy, the plays. The devil's got plays. He's got strategies. He's got ways to get you to walk according to his plan for your life rather than God's plan for your life. And in this series, we're talking about all the plays that he uses. And in the future uh, weeks, we're going to talk about what those plays are. So Paul says, put on the full armor of God so you'll be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Your, your true enemy is not the person you disagree with politically. Your true enemy is not the person who's hurt you the most. It's not your ex. It's not the family member that you can't stand. It's not somebody in the government. It's not the person you think is dragging our country into the ground. Each one of those people is somebody that Jesus Christ died for so that they may repent and be made new in him because he created them in his image with special value and dignity. And the people that you would expect Jesus to label as his enemies, his greatest enemies, the people who captured him, the people who falsely accused him, the people who beat him and whipped him and mocked him and spit on him and shoved a crown of thorns into his head and nailed him to the cross. When he was on the cross, he did not say about those people you would expect to be his enemy. He did not say, Father, curse them and destroy them for they're committing the greatest act of wickedness in history. He said, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. And that's the attitude he wants to have towards you, and that's the attitude he wants to have towards the people that you would like to think are the enemy, and that your enemy, your true enemy, would like to make you think is the enemy. There is something much darker and deceitful and hateful that wants to destroy you. Something much worse than any person on this earth that you might label your enemy, and they would love to get you to think they're not the enemy. They would love to go undetected and make you think the real cause of the problem in this world is another human being. But Paul says, that's not how it works. Our battle's not against flesh and blood. It's against the devil and the spiritual forces of wickedness that are united with him. <clears throat> so, if we're going to fight this enemy, how do, what, where do we start? What, what, what do we do? Well, the first thing you have to do to be able to fight an enemy is to know your enemy. Um, if your enemy is ta attacking you with a tank, you have to have a certain strategy for an enemy who attacks tank style, and you have to have a certain uh, strategy for someone who at attacks you, you know, with an air force. You got to know what you're dealing with in order to know how to respond. So in order to uh, do something about this enemy, we have to know the enemy. So let's take a, a look at what we can learn from the Bible about who this enemy is and how it operates. Um, so who is Satan, exactly. Is it someone who wears red tights and has horns and likes to poke people with farm tools? Uh, that would be nice because it wouldn't be very scary or difficult to deal with, but I don't think that's the case. Is it somebody uh, who rules hell and punishes people who go there? That's actually not in the Bible. The Bible doesn't teach that about Satan. Um, but the devil 
enters into the scene in the Bible very early on, as you've probably uh, heard before. God creates uh, the world. He creates all the life in it. And with each thing he creates, he says that it is good. And then when he comes to humanity, he makes it in his image with special value and dignity and says that it is very good. He creates something very good. And he goes to, uh, it actually says that they were naked and unaware. There's an author named Donald Miller, and he makes an interesting observation. He says, like, when he says, when I'm naked, that's the only thing I'm aware of. And yet, somehow, these people did not have shame about their bodies. Uh, they did not have shame or, or guilt, it seems. Um, they were in a very good place. And God comes to Adam, and he, co he commands him uh, this way. He says, the Lord, then the Lord commanded uh, the man, you may eat freely from the fruit, uh, from every you may you may freely eat fruit from every tree of the orchard But you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil for when you eat from it You will surely die now. Let's talk about what die or death means for a second death death is a separation So when you die your your spirit separates from your body and your body dies, but your spirit still continues to uh, exist but there's, that's not the only type of death there is. There's also, that's a physical death, but there's also a spiritual death where uh, you are separated from God, the source of all things that are good, the source of love, the source of all good and perfect gifts. That is a spiritual death. And what, what God is saying to Adam here is, you know, if you, if you eat of this free, uh, this tree, if you eat this free, this free fruit from this tree? No, if you eat of this tree, you're going to experience a physical death and a spiritual death. You're going to be separated from me. And presumably, if Adam never ate from that tree, his body would not have aged and passed away. And he would not have been separated from God. So, um, God said, that's what, that's what sin does. It separates. It causes death. It separates us from God. It, it causes our bodies to decay. So, um, Genesis 3, 1 uh, says this. Now, the serpent was shrewder than any of the wild animals that the Lord God had made. Now, here in this passage right here, uh, in this narrative at the beginning, you never actually hear anywhere that says the serpent is Satan or the serpent is the devil. So how do, we, how do people come to that conclusion? Well, Genesis, where this is, this is, is the first book in the Bible. But if you look at the last book in the Bible, in Revelation, it is uh, the recording. John, a man named John, writes a vision that God gives him about what the end times will look like. God gives him metaphorical imagery through a vision of what's going to happen in the end times. In one of those spots, in that vision that John writes, he says this. So that huge dragon, the ancient serpent, the one called the devil and Satan, <clears throat> who leads the whole world astray, was hurled down to earth and his angels with him. So the most noteworthy and really only noteworthy ancient serpent in the Bible is the one that we're talking about right here. And we're certainly seeing uh, in this story with Adam and Eve that he leads them astray. And I just want to kind of keep track of a few things we learn about Satan um, uh, throughout this. Uh, he is a deceiver. He leads people astray. He deceives the whole world. Um, so let's keep that on our list. We can also learn something from him about his name, the devil. That's a Latin word. The, uh, the Latin word diabolos is where we get devil from, and it means slanderer, someone who says false things intended to harm. Um, so, back to the garden. Now, the serpent was shrewder than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. The first time the devil comes on the, the scene, the first uh, characteristic that, he, that is uh, attributed to him is shrewdness. He is shrewd. He is cunning. He is clever. He, he should, we, we should not underestimate him when it comes to his abilities to come up with plays to destroy us and to separate us and to make us miserable. We, we should think of him as stupid when it comes to his decision to oppose God. If you read the book of Revelation, you'll see that it does not go well for him in the end. But we should not underestimate his ability to find ways to deceive us, to lead us astray, to slander us, to get us to believe things that are false that will ultimately end up in our destruction. We're, we're going to see it in a verse later that we're commanded to be alert and sober-minded when it comes to the devil. We need to be thinking about 
about how we can avoid his schemes and his plays that are in his playbook. So, um, continuing on in our story, he says to Eve, is it really true? Is it, is it really true that God said, you must not eat from any tree of the orchard? And the woman said to the serpent, we can eat from any fruit of the trees of the orchard, but concerning the fruit of the tree that's in the middle of the orchard, God said, you must not eat from it, you must not touch it, although God actually didn't say that, Eve just added that in for some reason, or else you will die. The serpent said to the woman, surely you won't die. For God knows when you eat from the tree, your eyes will open and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. Now, what the devil is trying to do here is trying to convince Eve that what God has prohibited is not to protect her. You're not going to die. He's not trying to protect you from something. He's trying to deprive you of something that will make your life better. That's the very first play in the devil's playbook. Is there any area in your life where you, you're tempted to think, this command from God that I'm getting in the Bible, it's not there to protect me. It's just there to ruin my fun. It's just there to deprive me of something that would make my life better. God wants to keep something from me rather than protect me. That's the first play in the devil's playbook, and it works. And I think that when we see something that we want to do in the Bible— we're, we are very naturally inclined to convince ourselves it's not there for our protection. But we try and convince ourselves that, really, it's okay to do it. I must just not understand. And that's how the devil gets his foot in the door. And that's how he destroys Adam and Eve. So Eve takes the fruit, she eats it, she gives it to Adam, he's there with her, he takes a bite, too. He was there the whole time. He didn't say anything about it. And immediately, they realize they're naked. They're, they're afraid of what God will think, and they feel shame, and they separate themselves from God. God shows up, and they try and hide from God, and they try and hide their sin and their shame, and eventually, their bodies do die. So, what do we do here? What do we do about an adversary who, who wants you to die, who wants you to be separated from God, who is shrewd, who slanders, who deceives, who's hard to detect, who wants you to blame another human being for the work that he is doing. How, what do you do about an enemy like that? Well, um, we're going to take a look at what Jesus' little brother James had to say about it. And so, James spent some time with Jesus, so he's got some good wisdom, and we find it in the New Testament of the Bible, and he's talking about repenting. He's talking about how um, we need to turn, or believe the things that we're, we think are, he's talking about turning from our sin. Realizing sin is actually sin, and calling it sin, and not saying, eh, there's nothing wrong with it, I can just get away with it. He's saying, no, no, identify sin as sin, and turn to God, ask for forgiveness, and follow his way instead. And he gets up to this point where he quotes the Old Testament and says, God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. So submit, uh, well, yeah, so submit to God. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble, so submit to God. Maybe jumped a little bit too far there. Um, this is the opposite of what Adam and Eve do. <clears throat> In their pride, they wanted to be equal with God. But, and they did not want to submit to him. They did not want to say, I want to do things your way, God. I'm going to trust that since you know, you know everything, that maybe you know what's best in this situation. They said, no, we're going to do what we want to do because we want to be equal with God. We're going to do things our way. And it did not go well for them. And then this is the... This is a verse, if you want to memorize a verse, memorize this verse, because this is the theme verse for this whole series. God opposes, the, or, but resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Resist the devil, and he will, will flee from you. He might be shrewd. He might have a, 
a million incredible plays in his playbook. He may be powerful. He may be strong. He may be great at deceiving you and leading people astray. But James says, resist the devil and he will put his tail between his legs and he will run away. James is not the only person who gives us this wisdom, but Peter, one of Jesus' closest followers, uh, says this, be sober and alert. Your enemy, the devil, like a roaring lion, is on the prowl looking for someone to devour. Resist, resist, resist him, strong in your faith, because you know that your brothers and sisters throughout the world are enduring the same kind of suffering. The devil is working on devouring people not here in this room who are trying to follow Jesus, but people around the world. And James would tell you, and Peter, Jesus' follower, would tell you, he may be strong, he may be smart, he may want to destroy you, he may scare you with the sound of his roars, but if you resist him, he will run away because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. That is what Jesus taught Jesus is far, far more powerful than the devil. I invite the band to come back up. So not only does he deceive, not only does he slander, not only is he shrewd, but he flees when we resist. So how do we resist the devil? What does that look like? We're just like, I'm resisting now. What, what, is, what does it take to do that? Well, it depends on the play that the devil is running. And in these next weeks, we're going to talk about a different play each week and what it looks like to resist that play from the devil's playbook. And when you do, he will flee. So I'm not trying to say that every flat tire and every broken leg and every mental illness is the enemy uh, making these things happen. There's a lot of just kind of natural suffering and evil in this world that happens. But there are plenty of things that the devil will try and do to separate you from God, to add more death into your life, to rob you of life. And, um, for example, like schizophrenia, sometimes people think, you know, if you're hearing voices, uh, some Christians think that's always the devil. I don't think that's the case. I might talk about that a little bit more in the future. Um, but most plays in the devil's playbook don't look supernatural. They don't look like somebody levitating or somebody's, you know, eyes bulging or them being able to speak a language they never learned, like ancient Latin, like some people report. I think those things do happen. We'll talk about, you know, the circumstances. Well, in the future, we'll talk about the circumstances when those sorts of things uh, tend to happen. But for the most part, his plays look a lot different. His plays are crafted in such a way that you will never know that they are happening so that you will not resist. Because the devil knows that when you resist, it's terrifying. And he runs not because you're resisting, but he sees whose power is inside of you. We'll close with this verse from Jesus' follower, John. He wrote, The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. What was the devil's work? To separate you from your Father in heaven who loves you more than you can imagine. It was to cause death. But Jesus came to die for you so you don't have to. So you don't have to take that punishment so that you can spend forever in the presence of a loving God who will wipe away every tear from your eye so that all you can be relieved of all of the doubts and the questions that you struggle with, so you can find joy and fulfillment in His presence when you search for so long and so hard to find satisfaction in things that always end up leaving you empty. Jesus died in your place because he loves you more than you can imagine. Because he does not want you to be separated from your Father in heaven. He wants you to be united with the God who does not lie to you, who speaks the truth, who is the truth, who is true, 
who does not lead you astray, who is wiser than the devil, and who would give everything to have a relationship with you because he loves you. And, you know, maybe you've never given your life to God before. You've never put your faith in Jesus. But maybe you want to do that right now. Let me just pray for you. God, um, you know, if, if, uh, let me just say, if, if that's what you want to do right now, if you're hearing this and you want that forgiveness that Jesus had made available to you through dying on the cross to take the punishment for your sin, just pray this in your heart. Father, I realized I have sinned. I haven't just made mistakes. I've sinned. And it was wrong. Forgive me. I thank you that you have forgiven me now. And that you took the punishment for my sin. And that you died. Out of, that you, you came back to life to show you have power over death. So that you have power over my death as well. Thank you that I can spend forever with you now. I choose to put you in charge. I will no longer seek pride and putting myself and my desires first, but I will humble myself and submit to you by following your teachings. And let me just pray for the rest of us. God, maybe this is opening up some new categories for people. Maybe this is confusing. Maybe it's scary. I don't know where this message is landing. But God, I pray that you would help everyone to take the next right step. Um, with what they've learned today. And I just want to come against the work of the enemy that may be working in people's lives right now and just say in Jesus' name, you may not attack the people in this room anymore. You must flee. You must go to the foot of the cross and receive your judgment. Father, fill this place with your Holy Spirit. Fill these people with your Holy Spirit and let them experience in this moment how great your love for them is. I pray that they would not buy into the lie that there is no enemy that is attacking them, or that their enemy is another human being, that you would fill them with love for the people that you died for. Give them the endurance to love the people who are hardest to love. Give me that, God, because I feel like I am not good at that. Please give me more patience and kindness and love for the people around me. And you, would you protect these people here, God, with your angels, and your spirit and bring healing to the wounds in the hearts of the people here who have been wounded by the enemy for the bitterness in hearts that is here God would you remove it would you help them to let go of it and find healing and would you teach us this next week how to res these next few weeks how to resist the devil and see how good you truly are when we see the devil free. Thank you, Jesus. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Gabe. You know, this isn't the most common topic to talk about at a church. <laughs> I spend a few weeks talking about the devil. And yet, so necessary. If we are truly in a spiritual battle, really, really necessary. So I'm really looking forward to these next few weeks, and I think we'll all be better equipped to live in God's kingdom and to resist the devil um, because of this. And the Bible has so much to share. So thank you again, Gabe. Um, hey, for those of you who, who love what we do at Hope, who want to support it, want to be part of it, um, there's a way that you can do that. You can always pray for us. Uh, you can also support the church financially if you'd like. HopeSB.com slash give is a really convenient way to do that. Uh, if you have something that you want to drop on the way out the door, we'll have a place that you can do that as well for a donation here today. And there's no pressure. <laughs> like, if you're here just checking things out, there's no pressure to give. This is, for those who consider hope to be, to be your home and you want to be on mission with us, um, then that's your opportunity to support us. So uh, that is all. We're going to have one final song here, and then we'll hang out with you outside on the patio. Looking forward to it. Please stand with us.
for being here. We look forward to seeing you next week.